up like people can see and hear me or whatever? Yeah, I think um, if Dr. Abbas wants to stop his screen share for a minute and we, then, then we'll be able to see you a little better. Okay, great. Okay, all right, you see me now? All right, okay. Hello everyone. Uh, Dr. Alan Abbas is a professor of psychiatry and psychology and the founding director of the Center for Emotions and Health at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. He completed his MD at Dalhousie University and did a residency in family medicine. He has worked as a family physician and emergency physician. He went on to complete a psychiatry residency at the University of Toronto, dedicating his career to teaching and researching the impact of emotions on health. Over the past 25 years, he has become a leading teacher and researcher in the area of short-term dynamic psychotherapy, having provided over 350 invited presentations and over 250 publications, including his first two books, uh, Reaching Through Resistance, Advanced Psychotherapy Techniques, and Hidden from View, A Clinician's Guide to Psychophysiologic Disorders. He has been both a lead and co-investigator of research into intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy, or ISTDP, for treatment-resistant depression, personality disorders, and somatic symptom disorders. He has received a number of awards, including a National Teaching Award in Psychiatry, and in 2018, he was named the David Mallon Visiting Professor of Psychotherapy at the Tavistock Clinic in London. And he is the current president of the International Experiential Dynamic Therapy Association. Uh, I realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dr. Nathan Toma, a psychologist on the um, voluntary faculty. And I wanted to add on a personal note uh, that after I first read Reaching Through Resistance, I was extremely impressed by the power of the techniques that Dr. Abbas described and the clarity of his writing. Since then, I've attended a variety of trainings in ISTDP led by Dr. Abbas and have also had the privilege of some individual supervision as well. Through these experiences, I've had the chance to see his skills in action in video recordings of sessions as he worked with obviously complex cases that were often previously refractory. And I watched with amazement on how ISTDB techniques in his skilled hands would cut through resistance seemingly like a hot knife through cold butter. And thus, I can speak firsthand to Dr. Abbas's notable abilities, not only as a scholar and researcher, but also a clinician, trainer, and teacher. Dr. Abbas may be a little annoyed with me for adding this to his introduction, as he specifically asked me not to hype him up too much. So I apologize, Dr. Abbas, <laughs> but, but, but speaking to my friends and close colleagues here at Cornell, I just had to speak my truth. Uh, lastly, one more thing, by the way, Dr. Abbas has asked that because clinical material will be shown on video, uh, that no one record any part of this presentation. Without further ado, Dr. Alan Abbas. Well, thanks very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very glad to uh, be here virtually. Uh, I'm going to put this over here. So, so in this um, meeting here today, we, we take a look a bit at the evidence for this treatment approach that we're talking about intensive short-term dynamic anyway, psychotherapy, talk about anxiety discharge pathways, unconscious anxiety pathways, and describe two treatment formats in, in this approach, two general formats. So these are three learning objectives here. So intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy or ISTDP was developed uh, in Montreal um, to increase access to patients on wait lists in the public system and to do something to shorten treatment uh, and make things to try to make treatments more efficient and also to try to work with people who were refractory to existing therapies. And it's a model that's built with emphasizing on building capacities of various types and handling defenses, depending on the type of patient. We'll see two formats of this treatment uh, that cover these two broad categories of treatment of elements. Uh, the goal is to build capacities, enabling healing of attachment trauma. So the, the centers on attachment trauma and how that's reactivated in current relationships and um, to uh, help the person heal those trauma up uh, by direct access to these unprocessed feelings about the trauma. And about five out of six patients referred to a psychiatric officer can, are candidates for this treatment. 
Uh, it starts the treatment. It starts with a trial therapy interview. It's a single interview of a couple hours duration. And it, that itself has an evidence basis shown to be cost effective and um, therapeutic within itself in one month follow up studies. And the training of this use in this model is all based on uh, on videos of actual cases. So uh, the trainers show video of their actual cases. Trainees study their own videos, show their own videos in small group format. Um, there's responsive use of video review from the trainers in response to trainees videos. And there's a lot of detailed examination of verbal, nonverbal, interactional processes, emotional processes. And that's the center of this whole approach. It was built on video review and long-term case follow-up. The um, rely a lot on immersion courses where we spend a few days on uh, detailing studies of one or more cases, all again on video. Uh, there's an algorithm a couple of algorithms of key processes that you can use that you tailor the process to the patient, but there's sort of a backbone of structure uh, that you can follow as well. And there's evidence of SASTA's uh, books. So there's a manual that's had, uh, that we, we use that's had over, uh, over 10 randomized trials now. The process is heavily focused on here and now relational emotional uh, processes to overcome resistances and mobilize therapeutic forces. So I'll say a little bit more about this as we go. Just to say a bit about the evidence base, original research from Davin Liu, uh, who is the founder of this method up at McGill University, uh, was a video-based large case series with follow-up and actually had patients view the videos and provide input onto the process. There's about 25 process-based studies that support the core principles of the method. It's around 70 outcome studies, around 40 randomized trials across the spectrum of psychiatric problems. There's a lot of these studies are on treatment refractory and complex cases. That's really the, the area where this approach can be particularly helpful. And there's over 20 of somatic symptom conditions, over 25 uh, studies of cost effectiveness. In meta-analyses, it's outperformed. It outperforms other bona fide treatment comparisons. Uh, and there's three studies uh, where it outperforms CBT for chronic pain. That's in a recent meta-analysis. So to give you an idea that the, the spectrum of psychiatric disorders has been studied with either case, with case series, case reports, and um, it's been randomized trials of these different groups here and cost studies throughout across a lot of these conditions as well and some meta-analyses of subgroups and the overall collection of the studies. So it's got a decent evidence base with various types of research supporting it. Um, so if you think more broadly, broadly around psychotherapy is what factors uh, are related to psychotherapy effectiveness, emotional mobilization and experiencing is, is become a sort of a key one uh, shown in uh, various studies and reviews as uh, an important uh, factor relating to outcome. And this is a cross therapy model. So for example, my uh, colleague who's uh, formerly from there, um, Lee McCullough and, and uh, uh, Winston's did the study uh, and uh, study way back when, but Lee did a later study looking at cognitive therapy uh, compared to short-term dynamic therapy for personality disorders and found that emotional experiencing was important across both modalities. The uh, work by Davinlu and David Mallon, who ended up collaborating together in the 80s, they came to a conclusion that the essential specific factor with patients who have attachment trauma is the actual experience of their feelings about the past and the present. To be able to tolerate and experience and, and process these feelings about various trauma in the past. And he coined the term unlocking the unconscious as a moments of access to uh, buried emotions that are mobilized in treatment processes. And there's three studies showing that there's greater effects when unlocking the unconscious can take place in the treatment. So just to say then we're talking about attachments and attachment trauma. Um, let's see if there's anything. Okay, great. So attachment 
if it can continue without interruption, uh, allows the person to have a relatively settled nervous system and have good expectations of other people and to transfer that forward into future relational experiences. But what happens when there's various kinds of trauma, like the death, illness, or um, abuse or neglect that comes from the parent? Parent dies, for example, huge trauma, depending on the age. And um, the the fear and pain attached to the trauma itself can induce rage toward the attachment figures. And that immediately becomes shut down with guilt. And you see a child now who is shut down with all these buried mixed feelings toward these attachment figures. And in childhood, you'll see somatic symptoms, anxiety, depression, self-destructive behaviors. And then they grow up into the adult system and it gets transmitted down the generational lines from one uh, parent to the child and then from the child to their child and it unconsciously is transmitted at the same time as that trauma these emotions come up and then can replicate something similar to the attachment trauma they went through we see that over and over again on detailed case studies um, so these feelings you know with these past people get mobilized with you the therapist and with current figures so this is, we all do this, this transference. We all transfer from previous experiences onto current experiences. Question is what gets transferred and what impact does it have on a person? So in a person with a lot of attachment trauma, what we see is these unconscious feelings get mobilized and activate unconscious anxiety. And the anxiety induces unconscious avoidant patterns, you know, um, habitual avoidant mechanisms to prevent the anxiety and to prevent awareness of the feelings. And so we talk about different categories of these different defense patterns that match up with the anxiety pathways. And we're going to see these in patients. So first is isolation of affect where the person can observe intellectually uh, what the feelings are that they have and talk about things without feeling anything though. That matches up with voluntary muscle tension, which is tension in the voluntary muscles seen with tension in any of the voluntary muscles, but it starts on the neck and goes south on the body to the arms, chest wall, abdomen, back legs and feet with hand clenching and sighing respirations. That's what you see on a seated person on video. So there's that category. And the other ones, repression, is when the emotions just disappear into the stomach or into weakness or into major depression. That correlates with seeing anxiety in smooth muscle, which affects the uh, blood vessels, airways, uh, bowel, uh, presenting as a bunch of psychosomatic or somatic symptom presentations to our medical colleagues. The third level, just calling primitive defenses, projective processes, splitting, is matched up with and is seen with cognitive perceptual disruption where the person goes blank, lose their vision, faint, have a seizure, uh, lose sensation, lose hearing. Um, and so these three kind of general correlates go together and allow you to assess and tailor your treatment to the patient's process. And I'll show, I'm gonna show a patient with isolation of affect. I'm gonna show a patient with primitive system and smooth muscle. So we'll see the two on video. So when you, we look at this spectrum of patients here um, that are categories that have these different features of anxiety and defense pathways, they also have different loads of trauma at different levels of age of trauma. So uh, a low resistant person has trauma later in development, like after age seven, for example, a parent dies and then when they're 10 years old, they only have mainly grief. They don't have any rage. They don't have any kind of buried self-destructive system in any sort, very healthy individuals. The treatment's only one or two sessions. Uh, we just don't see many of those people, but I know they exist. Um, I saw them in private practice a few times when I was doing psychiatry in, in a private office. Uh, the other categories have more trauma going earlier and having a more destructive effect on development in the person and their relationship to themselves and others. So there's moderate and highly resistant. Uh, with highly resistant, the person is tense and very defended and guarded uh, with various systems that keep anyone from getting close, uh, cutting off of others, and uh, self-defeating patterns of various types that the person keeps doing even though they don't really want to. 
um, and that's related to trauma that's going early uh, up to age two. Um, repeated trauma, like parent dies at age two. Um, the uh, other group in the middle here is repression. It's a person with dominant repression, a lot of typically irritable bowel syndrome, major depressive episodes, blood pressure problems, migraine headaches, uh, tiredness and fatigue. And the other spectrum here is this fragile spectrum going from mild to severe fragility. Severe fragility, the person has very limited anxiety tolerance of any sort. Uh, things tend to be split and projected heavily, uh, very destructive behavioral patterns. Mild fragile, they have some anxiety tolerance, but as soon as they get to the bit higher level of anxiety, then they get confused and go to fearful states and um, have some of the similar problems as more severe fragility. In an office study I did here, you can see here, this is where all the patients are down here in a psychiatric setting. These groups here are all non-remission risks when you wanna do traditional pharma single method, single pharmacotherapy, um, or you wanna do a support therapy, or you wanna try, I'm gonna say an out of the box cognitive approach, for example, um, short manualized versions that, without adaptations involved. This is a real risk groups. These people get too anxious. These people get sick physically. This group here, they're too defended to be able to engage. So then you're gonna see, um, you're gonna to have to do some different things here to work with these groups because the, these people can't tolerate the anxiety and these people can't engage. So this is where this model can, can be added to the tools, uh, the toolkits of the therapist. So let's take a look then at some of the general processes about unlocking the unconscious, this term. By the way, the term comes from patients. Uh, the patients say something got unlocked. They didn't have access to the feelings, but then they did get access to it. So it's um, so the first thing we do here is pressure. Pressure is encouraging healthy actions. We all do this when we do psychotherapy. We press, we encourage them to do something different, to um, care about themselves, to, to think differently, to behave differently in relationship to themselves. And um, to not avoid, we encourage them not to avoid. Whenever you do this inside a therapy model, it mobilizes these it mobilizes mixed feelings with you, the therapist, complex feelings. And of course, those complex feelings bring all these complex feelings up from the past. So you're going, you're activating the attachment system and all these feelings come up. Then you see a rise in unconscious anxiety, which immediately- no. It didn't work. Do you want to just, uh, maybe we'll just mute the, um, okay. So, um, and the unconscious anxiety shoots to unconscious defenses and the person can't help it. They just do it. Now the defenses come into your office when they, when they start to defend, then we clarify, help them see what they're doing and challenge, which is to help them block themselves from defending. When you do that, the person feels the complex feelings. They experience them physically. And the physical experience of the feelings, including appreciation and positive with you for helping them and, and irritation or anger that you're interrupting what they habitually do, uh, these feelings come through physically. And when they go through the body, they cut down the anxiety. The tension drops. They feel energized and with an aggressive feeling or positive feeling or both combined and it cuts the defenses down. See, if you cut the anxiety, you cut the defenses. And at the same time now, the defenses drop, their mind immediately is thinking of these past attachments and these times when they were close to others and they got hurt. And this memory and emotion system from the past gets activated. Um, and this is a process, the unlocking process is the opening of this memory and attachment system uh, and there's a term for this, this unconscious part of the alliance. That's these so, repression, people with a ton of repression, like this, a lot of stomach shutdown, exhausted depression, or fragile with all this dissociation, cognitive disruption. Um, they need some other things. They need some capacity building first. We help them regulate anxiety. We don't use challenge. Um, 
It's a lot of encouraging examination and reflection. And when you do this, it changes the anxiety into, vol into the voluntary muscle and it changes the defenses into isolation of affect. They build a, a base that now they can start to safely tolerate the very, very heavy feelings they've been through about things. And these feelings start to get experienced with you directly in the office and then linked back. So these patients can be thought of like this. The more severe end here, and this is this is um, a lot in common uh, with what I know about from understand from Dr. Kernberg's work of this different spectra of patients. These are all patients, all these are borderline patients of a type. Um, so at the one end is splitting projective processes, cognitive disruption, uh, repression, and then at this end here, they can isolate affect and tense up the muscles. Down here, they can't do that. They don't have that base. So everything is split and projected and confusion and nausea and terrible stomach symptoms. And the moderate is somewhere in between. So over treatment, we got to help them get from here to here. So I'll show you a little bit of an intake session. Um, There's one of the features of these patients is they rapidly rotate between confusion, cognitive disruption, projection, repression, where they get sick in the body and such, and self-attack. So they flip between these things. They can flip within seconds or minutes. They rotate quickly between these things. Uh, and we have to help face that and help them see what's happening with each of these different sort of stations that they go in between. This is a definition of borderline patients. They do this as a trend. And uh, patients that do this are called borderline, but they aren't all quotes DSM borderline, uh, or they're not for us what we call borderline. But you want to go right ahead? I'm not sure how we do the questions, but you can just turn on your mics or however you do it. Yeah, I'll be, hi, Dr. Abbas. Um, hi. Thank, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of the Grand Rounds presentation today. Um, to remind everyone, there are two ways to ask questions. You can click on chat at the bottom of the screen and direct your question to me to read. Alternatively, you can click reactions at the bottom of the screen and click the raise hand option. This will have you jump up to the top of my participants list. I will then call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Just a reminder, I will be prioritizing trainee questions. Um, so we actually have one question from a trainee already. Um, what about this treatment um, makes it characterized as a psychodynamic treatment rather than perhaps an offshoot of CBT connecting thoughts, feelings, and behaviors? Okay, so the, um, it's fully psychodynamic because it involves conscious and unconscious processes, transference uh, from past to present. Um, so it, and it has to do with unconscious feelings, anxiety, and defenses. Now, that might happen. Uh, this might take a focus sometimes in cognitive behavioral therapy, either on purpose or just because two people get together and do some things that seem to be necessary to help a person deal with their schema and their trauma that keep them in stuck belief systems and stuck avoidant behavior. So that can take place. And it's something that is, will be familiar to people, uh, particularly more experienced people with CBT that are working uh, through their experience. Uh, but it's got certainly some elements of cognitive work here and there. There's no question. It's got some behavioral pieces, but it's all built in the objective is psychodynamic of healing unconscious processes uh, and unconscious feelings that have been unre unresolved. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, well, we have two other questions about this very impressive approach. Number one, have there been any trials for telehealth methods of this therapy? And number two, how can we get training in this method? Well, there is one, uh, there's, there are two RCTs of using a telehealth format. Uh, one, it outperformed um, a treatment as usual for chronic pain. There's another chronic pain one compared face-to-face -face and and online. Face-to-face -face was better than, in, than online, not shocking. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's hard, it's, it's, it's not as effective for most people online compared to in person. For example, I'm wearing basketball shorts right now and I'm six foot nine, can you tell? <laughs> you can't tell anything, you don't see that, you just see this, right? So the thing is that we're not all there and neither is the patient all there when we do this online stuff. So better than nothing though. 
Um, can you recommend any training programs in the U.S. for intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy? There, there are several. I mean, there's, there's online courses, uh, these immersion courses. They're sort of the backbone of supervision courses, or we'll call core training, where people have days of video supervision. So those, cor those courses, like you can, add, those are accessible. Like, um, talk to you can email me or 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 Nate. Toma about that, about the courses. So there's a bunch of them this year. And one I'm going to show is the severely, uh, uh, tw first 20 sessions of a patient with severe borderline disorder. I'm going to show that in June. And, um, and we have a personality disorder one in the fall, and we have uh, um, one on uh, pre PTSD. And uh, so there's different ones that come every, every few months. Video supervision is the ongoing thing. Um, uh, Nate, what do you think? Nate's going to start presenting and teaching some of this there. <laughs> I some, someday, someday, <laughs> someday. Yeah. But I've got to, I got, I got to train up first. I'm just, I'm just beginning to be introduced to this, to this approach. Yeah. And it, it does have to my mind commonalities with CBT, which has been my historically, my primary orientation. Um, and, uh, but thinking of more in terms of the contemporary CBT with a lot of exposure to emotion, and that's what attracts me to it is a sophisticated method of exposure with response prevention for the defenses. That's, that's really where I see a lot of the added value here. Um, and, but the big difference though, from CBT is such intensive focus on the transference. That's the biggest difference in what's newest to me, just to to add that part, but I'm happy to email with people further about training stuff as well. Great. Um, we have a question from Dr. Yeomans, if you want to unmute yourself. Frank, how are you doing? Good. How are you, Alan? It's really great to see you. Great, and thanks. I wanted to thank you for an excellent presentation that brings up so many ideas about, you know, how to pursue some of what you're discussing. I just wanted to make a comment and then ask a question. First of all, I think your emphasis on the video is wonderful. Uh, in our group, you know, with Otto Kernberg, John Clark, and the Personality Disorders Institute, over time, we've established the same appreciation of the nonverbal. And it seems, especially with patients with personality disorders, everything important gets communicated through the nonverbal. And it goes against the more traditional analytic model of paying such exquisite attention to the word and to the free associations. That's just my comment. But I had a couple of questions. One is, I could imagine this working very well for uh, dissociative identity disorder patients. I imagine you do that. I don't think you mentioned them specifically, but yeah. could you comment on that? And then I'll ask another question. So only I've only treated a few. I have colleagues I supervise that have treated more. Um, and so I have one I've worked through with fascinating just an unbelievably fascinating process i mean i have teaching video from this you know a patient sits down in the consult and uh starts immediately in the consult 50 year old woman curling up in a ball starts mm -hmm. hitting herself on the head and can't speak english anymore and she's mm -hmm. like a small baby uh you know and uh it's a fascinating process um uh, so i i don't have a ton of experience we have a lot of dissociation dissociative sort of pieces in a sense it's maybe a bit different like that patient i showed with the vocal problem mm -hmm. she had um she had a dissociated disconnect from herself the girl it was always like it was she it was never her until she could feel the feelings then it was like that's me and it became yeah. it was such a warm and painful thing when she was able to incorporate the girl that she was into herself so there's that oh that's a common one but a formal did uh you know it's not super common for, at least in my experience, to, to treat, but could do. Well, I was thinking about it with that second patient. She had that flavor, and some of what you did seemed to involve some basic grounding techniques yep. that we have to do. But then my other question, first of all, your work seems a little bit like our TFP on steroids. It's fascinating. <laughs> I really dive into it and insist upon it. The only reservation I might wonder about is insofar as you keep saying, you know, I'm here to help you, we're here to work together. Could there be a little bit of a kind of a suppression of a negative transference and a maintenance of an internal representation of the ideal object yeah. 
and yeah. that would lead to the difficulty of totally integrating a fragmented cell. Oh yeah, and that would make a terrible trouble with termination too. So we don't see those though, because see, she came in with the positive, and then I asked what else is coming because she got immediately anxious. You see, so I'm always, it's always about the complex feelings. When she's self-attacking, I'm pressing on self-caring. But even when I do that, it's super irritating for her that I'm doing that. And I'm, mm. and I'm welcoming forward as uh, your, your group is your, you know, is all the negative complex feelings, all of them, all of them, not just positive though, not just anger, all of it. And the partly the goal is building capacity to hold them all together. The other part is just so that when they come, they're felt and they don't get a big neurosis stuck with me and they can't terminate with me. So we don't mm. see these kind of termination problems because of, of the transference feelings are processed as they come through. They're felt through, including positive rage, grief, guilt, everything that comes up in the attachment moment. So we actively have eyes on that piece, put it that way. Good. Thank you very much. Great. We have a question from Dr. Rundle then. Thank you. Really enjoyed uh, your talk um, and appreciate your um, sharing of the videos. I think it really brings it uh, alive um, and, and hopefully will make us braver in videotaping ourselves. Um, I'm a child psychiatrist, and I think that often recognizing and uh, feelings, um, somatic feelings, um, other kinds of feelings, as well as sort of learning how to manage behaviors or the, the impulses is, is developmentally part of what occurs during childhood and adolescence. And I wonder how young um, some of the uh, studies have gone to. Um, and uh, for us, we see a lot of actual aggression in sessions at times. And I'm, I'm wondering whether um, uh, that happens at times. Yeah, so it's uh, the first part uh, there. We have a data set of patient of young um, with cost data. It just hasn't been published yet. It's under 25 and goes back to, I think 12 is the youngest we've worked with. Uh, so if they can operate somewhat individually, uh, you know, otherwise they should have a family approach if they're too young and they're not able to, you know what I mean? Like, or work with a parent. I still remember doing a consultation with a, with a, with a kid, an eight-year-old kid, and he was all tense. And I was trying to see if he could notice his emotions and the mother fainted. Well, I was asking the son about what's going on. You see, so then I have to deal with the mother, uh, you know, was, who had a lot of fragility. So treating the mother would help in that situation or one of the parents. Um, as far as um, the second part was around, what was the second part again? It was around? Uh, whether you have encountered aggression in- Oh yeah, yeah, we, 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 we don't see it. I mean, we have so much eyes on the anxiety and the holding of mixed feelings together. Now, this patient had attacked people and had criminal charges, but that was from a mechanism where uh, that she was seeing the other person as attacking them. And you see, it's hard to project on me the way I'm relating to her that I'm there attacking her. It's hard to see me as an attacker. So what instead she has to do is regulate herself and in her case, dysregulate herself and keep these things in because I'm there in a helping role. And I, even though it's challenging, I'm there clearly to assist. And that prevents the projection that I'm there to attack her. So um, projection is the main culprit when it comes to, uh, you know, acting out in a session, I think. The other is if they get too disorganized, they don't know what they're doing. They're just dissociating. That uh, we prevent by watching the threshold. We're constantly trying to stay under that threshold. So we're training all the time on regulating down. And particularly for adolescents, it's really helpful, you know, because they, a lot of them don't have the developmental capacity to regulate themselves. So we do that training, help them learn to reflect, work in a graded way, compare one thing to another, move, right? I'm very present, active. So they have, they always have me to draw on. So um, blank screen scenario, that's when you're going to see aggression acting out and patients running out of the office. We just don't see that. They're, they're, they're comfortable in there, even though they're uncomfortable. <laughs> So, okay. Um, we have a question from Dr. Knopfelacher. Thank you for a, a really compelling talk. I, um, I, Nathan told me about this over a year ago and I've been, you know, excitedly hearing about, about uh, his, his experiences. And now it's great to, to see you present it in, in such a clear and compelling manner. 
I, I have a million questions, but I'm, I'm going to boil it down to two. Um, one, one thing that I'm trying to understand from all that you packed in today in terms of the process is thinking about that patient with all of the complex trauma history. As I, I'm kind of watching it, I'm looking as like you were meeting her tabula rasa in that first appointment. You said it was a consultation and quickly got into to the transference in the moment. But how much is there um, unpacking all of the past life experiences? I know that the work is done in the moment, oh, but yeah. understanding the context of trauma oh, yeah. and attachment for this. Oh, and yeah. then the second question, which was probably very quick, is, is just talking about uh, long-term outcomes because we, yeah. we, we have compelling data about the, the progress and just what that looks like a few years later. Yeah, so um, the... the um, Long-term data piece, I mean, we have four or five-year long-term healthcare use follow-up data. That's the best indicator for people because these are somatically ill people we mostly see. And you see this down into the normal range and stay that way in long-term follow-up, including people with bipolar and psychosis that we have this as an adjunct regulatory treatment approach to add on. Uh, so there's a huge drop in healthcare use that persists in long follow-up. When we've done formal follow-up in the RCTs like... Uh, uh, the treatment resistant depression one, the personality disorders, they maintain their gains or get a little bit more gains on average on the main measures. Now, of course, so now I said that one, now I got to get back to your first question. <laughs> I should have done the first one first. Go ahead. It, it, it was it was just about the, all of the content, you know, right. of history. Um, yeah, so how do we deal with of the transfer? So the, when, here's how that comes in. First of all, I don't want the patient to go to the past and fall over and faint in my office. So I, we don't get there. We don't go there until they're calm, settled, and able to link something back in a way that they can withstand it. So I'm not worried about that. It's going to show when they're ready. It'll show either with like imagery that shows up through the day, uh, a vivid dream that's actually a memory, or it'll show up by feelings coming up with me. So it'll, it'll show through the office and then they're ready. Then their muscles are good. See, by the time she's session 24, you can see she's so solid. She's able to go and, and you know, take care and rescue that little girl, you see, and go through those trauma that she went through. And it's very heavy content. But by that point, she had been, she had sort of been back there and experienced a lot of that already by 24 uh, in varying degrees of integration while doing so. So it's when it's ready. I'm more interested in building capacity uh, when it comes to that. I'm not concerned about past yet. It sort of dips in. It sort of you get information that you need in the first in the first few meetings, though. So I'm not worried about the information issue. I got to do medical history. I got to deal with medications. I got to deal with all that too. These are medically complicated patients. I mean, look at this Crohn's and epilepsy. <laughs> you know, by the way, these are patients you really need a medical help. You know, a psychiatrist, somebody involved, or a physician to help you out on this because then you come with 30 pills a day and then you got to deal with all that, taking them away, hopefully. So it's, it's complicated work uh, for these cases. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Ashar. Hey, Dr. Abbas, thanks for the great talk. I've been reading your work on chronic pain. It's great to uh, hear you present. I am also like Nate coming from a CBT background. So one thing that you know, stood out to me was this focus on the interpersonal relationship in the moment in the room between the, the you know, provider and the patient. And um, could you comment a bit about the importance of that? And, you know, instead of focusing on the patient's anger towards the boss, towards the parent, towards the, the significant other, why are you pressing on like, you know, what do you feel towards me right here, right now? This, this is uh, the multiple functions in the dysregulated patient. First of all, this is attachment as the exposure okay mm. an attachment moment as the exposure that brings mm. any unfinished business with it any anxiety and the other mechanisms they're all coming up because you're a potential attachment see and that's no different in your office than mine see regardless of the model so these beginning moments there's so much happens and um so you're using here and now to regulate anxiety. You use here and now in other cases to help them change defenses around or reduce certain defenses like avoidance uh, that you know the, this first woman patient with the fibromyalgia was detaching to help her stay present. Uh, and the third part is um, uh, helping them experience feelings that come from the past. So activating, 
uh, regulating anxiety and handling defenses. Those are three main objectives of why we use a therapeutic relationship. And uh, so I hope that, does that, hope that helps. So those are kind of the three main things uh, that you're using the here and now relationship for. And it's just, it also just gets the patient not afraid of what, they, what, they, what they're gonna feel. They also, it's like a multiple test for you, I think. It's like, are you gonna, what are you gonna do? When I bring my worst defense, what are you going to do? Are you going to yell at me? Are you going to prescribe me more pills? Or what are you going to do? Are you going to transfer me? You see, these are all the fears the patient has, but you've got multiple tests that you got to pass in those first 15 minutes. If you can do it, I'll tell you, the whole treatment course can be really different mm. at first half hour if you can hold. And you're going to get to the cognitive stuff. You're going to get to the behavioral stuff. Don't worry about that. I would put that a second and try to do the relational piece and, and see what it can add. It also just gets to be more comfortable for both you and the patient. I mean, she's so she was coming in so activated, right? So distressed, and it, um, so. Great, thank you. Okay. Yeah. We have a question from Dr. Karski. Um, I, you're muted, I think, Dr. Karski. Still muted. Oh. Okay. I think it's still um, still muted. It's, I don't know how to. Oh, Monica, you're hmm. muted. The mic's not working here. Yeah, I think it's a settings problem. You can type it. Ask. You can type it. You want to type it? <laughs> okay, we can. If you'd like to type it, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. Um, uh, Kartik Sripada, if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks so much uh, for this great uh, presentation. I just had two questions. One, I was wondering, I mean, uh, in, in real, uh, looking at like kind of the relationship in, in the room, uh, I was wondering if you had any comments on like the role that countertransference plays um, in this, like, uh, you know, and I think the, the other question I have is um, at, when you start with this, um, is there any sort of framing that or like spiel that you kind of give just so that if in terms of framing expectations uh for for okay. them um so you saw the whole contact at the beginning of those two cases so that gives you an idea now they get a letter out front to say to meet whether to evaluate whether or not emotions are part of your health problems and physical problems that's we send them a letter and then they come in and we start if they start activated I don't take a history first, I do this first. I settle them and then we did the history later. Uh, if they come with, uh, you know, without too much activation, then I'll take some history up front and then you'll together accumulate a frame, a frame for the process. Um, does that help with that one? Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. And counter-transference, um, you know, I'll, I'll defer to um, Dr. Kernberg and colleagues around this because we, we think of it the same way about the idea of concordant and complementary countertransference uh, in, in the sense that, for example, I might be able to pick up and resonate and feel something the patient's feeling. I get heat in my chest when they get heat of anger, for example, as a concordant experiential thing. Uh, so the other time is the patient might become furious at themselves. You might feel anger that wants to go to them. Okay, so there's those things. Then there's another whole thing, which is your own childhood feelings coming up, which happens to all of us. So particularly early in training, you'll find a lot of emotions come up from things you've been through before when you try to interface because attachment's a two-way thing. Patients getting an attachment pull from you, you're getting an attachment pull from the patient. That brings up any attachment business, unfinished business in us. So you get the opportunity on your video review or just when you're in the office, you'll feel things, you'll feel grief, you'll feel, and it ties to old losses and you feel some rage that comes. And, and guilt about that. And that ties to things you've been through. So it's like a double therapeutic process possible. And so a lot of times just on video review, you get an opportunity to go through some things from the past. Just, it just adds, it's an added bonus for you. <laughs> um, we have one, I think we have time for one last question. Um, Dr. Abbas, if you can speak about erotic transference, uh, transference in this therapy. So, um, there can be a defensive function of that. Um, the, so if the process is not mobilized and activated and it's unfocused, there can be a sexualization can happen in the 
therapeutic relationship that gets resolved by pressing and focusing. So there's that. The other thing is sexualized aggression. Uh, patients who have sexualized aggression, say an urge to rape, uh, that's buried with guilt from trauma, those feelings come up and they'll experience them the same as the rage. So they'll experience a feeling like an, uh, an urge to rape that has a sexual arousal component and the rage of the heat to do an aggressive act. And then the guilt, and it's tied to, again, this whatever past trauma they've been through. So those are kind of two, and there's more to say about that, but that's, those are a couple of thoughts right now. But we don't see this sexualization thing either. It just, there's no room for it in the process uh, as far as a, a neurosis of that. Um, so, yeah. But sexualized you... trauma and, and uh, those feelings, I don't know, that's, that's there in the, more, in the more traumatized individuals typically. And they'll feel like, and they don't know what's happening when the rage is coming, they have a sort of a genital arousal thing, but then they realize it's a rage that wants to do something sexually aggressive, right? So, okay. We have a lot of questions coming in, but um, we're gonna have to conclude the Q&A portion for today. Let me thank you again, Dr. Abbas, for a great presentation. See everyone next week. Thanks a lot for having me, appreciate it.